So I'd like to uh, talk a bit about how we see uh, optical capacity scaling to meet internet demand over the next uh, decade or more. Uh, so an interesting article uh, was published in January by Adil Saleh uh, and Jane Simmons, uh, Adil's program manager at DARPA. Uh, he made a sort of audacious claim that the internet is going to grow, has to grow a thousand X over the next 20 years. Uh, how did it get there? Pretty simple, actually. Just by taking 40% uh, uh, compounded annual growth rate uh, over 20 years, you're going to get to 1,000x. Uh, but he went further and uh, talked, uh, discussed, he and she, uh, uh, Otto and Jane, uh, put forth a proposal for how we actually might get there. Uh, and some interesting things fell out. Uh, first of all, that uh, their, their first uh, factor of three uh, was just using the capacity that's already there in the network today. An awful lot of capacity is actually uh, there in the transport network and is unused because, uh, or actually all the network, uh, that's unused uh, because of uh, inefficiencies. Uh, but the biggest factor is simply by increasing spectral efficiency on fibers in the optical transport network. And, oops, go back. There's about a 10x, uh, at least a 10x there. Um, and I think that's starting from a baseline of today's 40 gigabit per second uh, per, per wave. Um, uh, for, uh, tr transport systems that put about three terabits of uh, capacity, three or four terabits of capacity on a fiber. Um, so uh, first we need to understand what the transport layer is. Uh, I think a lot of guys here, or people here, are, are focused on uh, the, the IP network where of course you've got uh, service routers and peering routers and all your core routers. But there's an optical, a whole other, actually two whole other networks that sit below that. First an OTN network. Uh, that is there in a lot of cases, not all cases, uh, but that OTN network is to, uh, the purpose is to uh, do sub-lambda grooming or, or allow you to uh, do TDM multiplexing of smaller circuits onto the, the bigger wavelengths. Uh, and then, of course, the WDM network itself uh, underlies that, and, and the, uh, when you, those black lines between routers are really going in and out of the transport network as it goes across the country or around the world. So uh, how, we've been, how have we been uh, scaling the optical transport network uh, in the last uh, decade and a half is really through WDM, and the network's been scaling simply by take by a scaling up the bit rate per wavelength, uh, but second by scaling up the number of wavelengths. And we've gone from you know, two and a half gigabits on a single wavelength to two and a half gigabits on four, eight, sixteen wavelengths, forty wavelengths, and then up to ten gigabits, and it's you know, scaled up to 160 wavelengths uh, in uh, in some cases today at uh, 10 gigs uh, or 40 gigs at uh, 80 wavelengths or 100 wavelengths. Uh, how are we going to continue from here? Are we going to continue scaling up the, the uh, bit rate per wavelength, scale up the number of wavelengths, uh, possibly a little bit of both? Uh, actually, the uh, number of wavelengths actually might come down, as I'm going to show here, uh, but the bit rate per wavelength, or actually channel, or super channel, as I'm about to discuss, uh, is going to go up. So it's interesting to compare uh, optics to what's happened in all other forms of communication, uh, wireless, uh, you know, microwave, uh, cell phones, et cetera, uh, even copper uh, lines like DSL. And in these uh, types of technologies, what we've done is, is uh, increase the spectral efficiency or, or the bits per second per hertz uh, on those media uh, through very advanced digital signal processing enabled by advanced silicon uh, technologies. And, uh, and today, through you know, things like QAM modulation, very high order QAM modulation, we're able to get several, you know, as many as 10 uh, bits per hertz uh, over those media. The optical world, uh, we've started very low because of WDM. Uh, we've been able to, well, just been able to, because of the uh, incredible bandwidth of, of fiber, we've been able to increase just on a TDM basis um, and then the, the uh, number of wavelengths. Uh, and we've been on a very steep curve, and lately here we're starting to take advantage of the same uh, DSP and uh, VLSI technology uh, in the network uh, that's being deployed today. Uh, these technologies are starting to come into use uh, to do things like electronic uh, chromatic dispersion compensation uh, and 40 gig and 100 gig uh, coherent communication, which I'm going to talk about more. So since the advent, advent of uh, DWDM, we've been relying on a few uh, key technologies or techniques. Uh, first is just intensity modulation. So we simply turn the laser on and off, basically. Turn the light on and off. Uh, and then direct detection. You just impinge the uh, incoming uh, wavelength or, or light signal on a photo detector and directly uh, get ones and zeros out of it. 
And with WDM, we've been having multiple wavelengths separated and according to this ITU grid uh, that prov uh, provides a standard for uh, the spacing between these wavelengths. Going forward here, the network that's being deployed now is relying on phase modulation instead of intensity modulation. We've learned how to modulate the actual phase of the light. Uh, and then coherent detection by uh, beating the incoming signal with a local oscillator in much the same way that radio does. Uh, and then, but we've still been relying on ITU grid uh, to separate the uh, different wavelengths. And that, that's going to be changing in the future. As we go forward here, we're going from uh, simpler phase modulation up to qual modulation. And we're going to be, uh, instead of just using uh, coherent, simple coherent detection, we're going to be using coherent wave combining and separation, which I'm going to talk about further, and moving to uh, what's called gridless super channels, which I'll cover. All right, so let's just look a little bit at advanced modulation formats. The metric of comparison uh, for optics has always been the capacity reach product. There's always been a trade-off in technology between the distance you can go and the, the amount of capacity that you can put over that distance. And they they uh, have, uh, in any generation, it has a rough constant uh, that you can get to for that uh, level of technology. And, and that, um, uh, that uh, sort of constant is, is now peaking out uh, with the Polmux QPSK, or quadrature phase shift king uh, scheme that's being used uh, today in the 40 gig and 100 gig uh, per wavelength technology that's being rolled out. As we go forward and start uh, implementing QAM technologies, 8 QAM and 16 QAM and who knows, 64 QAM or higher uh, someday, uh, those technologies are going to give us more, re uh, more capacity, but because of the nonlinearities of fiber, it takes, well, it takes more power to, uh, to get those additional uh, phase states and, and higher order QAM. But that additional power, uh, because of the nonlinearity of fiber, uh, impacts the OSNR of it, and you're actually going to uh, as you use those technology, it actually decreases the uh, capacity reach product, which is unfortunate. unfortunate. You can't just keep pumping up capacity without, unfortunately, taking a hit on the reach. So uh, the nice thing about phase modulation is it's much more tolerant of uh, fiber impairments like chromatic dispersion, polarization mode dispersion, nonlinearities, et cetera. And we can put more bits uh, per symbol, more uh, data onto the fiber. Uh, but as we uh, increase the baud rate, uh, of it, of course, uh, the, those impairments have always uh, scaled with the square of, uh, of the data rate or the symbol rate, uh, which is leading us to, of course, uh, using higher order qualms. And um, the nice thing about the phase modulation is it uses this co coherent detection, <coughs> which enables the uh, use of DSPs, very, very high, uh, very powerful uh, DSP technology. And the result of all these things is that uh, today's 100 gig uh, wavelength technology that's being deployed actually gets the same or even better reach uh, than 10 gig and, and even two and a half uh, before it. Uh, so, but we have a problem. If we, as we want to keep going forward, if we want to try to get to terabit waves and we want to increase the uh, capacity on the fiber from 10-ish you know, terabits, which 100 gig is going to give us uh, to 20 in the 20s or 40s or up to 100 uh, terabits on a fiber, uh, how do we get there? How do we get to terabit waves? First question we really have to ask is, do we really want a terabit wave, or are we what we, is what we're looking for just a terabit on a line card? A terabit is a single uh, installable unit, a single through. And uh, I think the industry is, is uh, reaching the conclusion that uh, really that's what you're looking for, and that 100 gig per wave, or sorry, terabit per wave and higher is actually not going to be practical as the uh, following charts are going to show. So uh, how is the coherent uh, detection done? Uh, you basically take your wavelength coming in and you put it through this optical mixer circuit that separates the polarizations, it separates the phase states, it separates uh, the wavelength, and, and it separates it into a number of different signals. And it takes you know, as many as eight photodetectors for each wavelength to get that, all that information and get it into the DSP uh, through a bank of ADCs. So in previous generation technology with direct detection, you only had a single photodetector. Now it takes eight times as many uh, to, uh, to, to decode a, a single wavelength. Um, so that requires, well, obviously a lot more optical circuitry, which makes your optical circuits uh, very complicated. It also now, uh, though, enabled these, these, these ADCs. These ADCs are running at tens of gigasamples per second. Uh, it's just unfathomable uh, what, uh, how, uh, how ADC technology has advanced here in the last few years. Uh, it used to be you know, gigasamples per second was hard. Now we're doing tens, you know, 20, 30, 40 gigasamples per second uh, with you know, multiple bits, six bits per uh, sample. Uh, 
Uh, so if you're using this A to D technology, if you wanted to do a terabit wave, what would it mean? First, this, this chart is showing a couple different things, actually. It's showing the uh, bits per symbol uh, that you're, you're using as you go with the higher order uh, QAM uh, technologies and the OSNR penalty. That OSNR penalty basically uh, is what impacts your reach. Uh, as you're, if you're going up to 64 qualm, for instance, you're taking a 10, nearly a 10, 9, 10 dB um, OSNR penalty that directly comes off your reach. So you want to be at a lower, like a, uh, the QPSK, which is where 100 gig uh, is coming out. But if we look at the symbols per second, the, the, the uh, rate at which the ADCs have to run, if you wanted to do a terabit per wave, it's simply impractical. If you wanted to do a BPSK uh, uh, decoding, uh, or, or, or a signal, uh, it would take 640, that's running at 640 gigabaud. And the ADC actually has to run at twice that rate for the Nyquist rate. Uh, and, you know, a, ter a trillion, more than a trillion uh, samples per second is just simply going to be impractical any time in the future. The, uh, by 2014, uh, commercial ADCs we think are going to be running at about 64 gigasamples per second. Uh, so even if you go to QPSK, you're still at 320 gigabaud or 640. Uh, gig samples per second. Even up at 64 qualm, you're at 105 uh, gigabaud or a couple hundred uh, gig samples per second. So it's clearly out of reach of where we think ADC technology is going to be. So clearly, we're not going to do it, get to a terabit you know, wave or a terabit signal through a single wavelength uh, technology. Just electronics are just not going to get us there. So the industry, in the optical uh, industry, is pretty, uh, there's pretty good consensus now that instead of a single wave, what we're going to do is use WDM type technology to have multiple waves that are grouped, or multiple channels that are grouped into what's called a super channel. And the super channel will be routed through the optical network the same way a channel or a wavelength was previously, but all the channels within the super channel all flow uh, together and they all get uh, modulated uh, with a separate piece of the modulator that I'll show uh, and, and decoded with mod demodulators as I uh, just showed. So what, what are the technologies going to make these super channels uh, possible? Uh, in particular, it's these, the coherent wave separation and the, the gridless super channels uh, that I talked about. So in the past here, when we've done direct detection for 2.5 gig, 10 gig, et cetera, we've used a wavelength demux to separate the wavelengths and take that uh, wavelength and, and, and uh, impact it on a, uh, a photo detector shine on a photo detector. But the, the WDMs um, have had to have guard bands between them. Each, because of the f way that they're physically, literally physically separated, you have to have some amount of spectrum between each signal to keep them separate. Uh, because the, even though you're on an ITU grid, each device through the network, whether it's a transmitter or the receiver or all the rotoms and WSSs in between, uh, they're all not on exactly the same thing, so you have some imperfection. And that imperfection, you have to compensate. The, the ISI that it would create uh, has to be compensated by using these guard bands to separate them. Um, even uh, uh, when we go to local oscillators through, for coherent communication for 100 gig or 40 gig, uh, you still have to, we're still using the ITU grid, and we're still using these WDMs to keep the signal separate. And the local oscillator is tuned to roughly the uh, wavelength uh, that you're trying to uh, decode uh, the same wavelength that the WDM the multiplexer is giving you. So uh, going forward here, um, you know, we're, we're using coherent detection to get greater, greater reach. We're still staying on a, a grid-based uh, wavelength demux architecture. And this is the current state of the art for what's being deployed today and over the next few years uh, with 40 gig and 100 gig uh, per wave. Uh, going forward again, uh, this, this chart is showing what these super channels are going to look like today. As I said, if you have each channel, uh, if it's 100 gig, it's separated by these guard bands. That's that red space in the spectrum there. That's wasted space. And there's roughly 25%. If you're sending a terabit with 10 channels at 100 gig each, roughly 25% of your spectrum is completely wasted uh, because of these guard bands. So with coherent wave separation, we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, the bottom left shows instead of those guard bands, we're packing all the channels in the super channel much more closely together, and we're separating those through the use of the DSP technology. Uh, through the, the uh, coherent demultiplexer, you're separating the polarizations and the phase states, as I said. You're, you're uh, beating it with a local oscillator, uh, and, and that, that uh, by the time it gets in the DSP, you're actually able to use the DSP to filter out um, the ISI from other uh, signals and filter out one channel versus another. And it turns out that digital signal processing uh, is a lot more accurate than uh, trying to, uh, using digital signal processing to separate the different channels is a lot more accurate than trying to separate them optically.
So you're able to re uh, get that 25% back, basically, and pack them much more closely. Now, between the super channels, though, since you want to still route those with today's WSS or Rotom technology, uh, you still need those guard bands. Uh, and uh, the question is, how big can that super channel be and how much uh, uh, capacity do you want to route at one time? So how many channels do you want at which bit rate? Uh, because of the, if you look, though, at the complexity of these uh, coherent demodulators, uh, especially when you get to super channels where you're demodulating a whole bunch of channels separately, it's really getting to be a very complex optical circuit. As I said, it takes eight photodetectors for each channel. If you have 10 channels in the super channel, all of a sudden you need 80 uh, photodetectors just for each uh, terabit super channel. Yeah, that really tells you that you really need to have some sort of, uh, it will really be economically uh, important to have some sort of photonic integrated circuit uh, technology to uh, do that implementation. Um, so. Uh, what does this now look like here? Uh, yeah, the, the WDM is now demultiplexing the super channels from each other, but each super channel is now coming into an optical demultiplexer circuit that's using one or more local oscillators to separate out the uh, different wavelengths, uh, sending it through this fairly complicated optical circuit that's literally pulling it apart into 80 different ways and putting those on 80 photodetectors, 80 ADCs, uh, and into an incredibly complicated DSP. These DSPs are literally running at trillions, tens of trillions of operations per second. Uh, they're incredible uses of silicon uh, electronic uh, ASIC technology, uh, enabled by you know, basically Moore's law, but 28 nanometer silicon and, and things like that. Um, so this uh, just shows if you have a bunch of super channels, each one uh, is being independently uh, demul demultiplexed and processed. Now, what is the result of using these super channels? The curve that was before where uh, I'm getting more capacity but lower reach uh, through uh, QPSK, AQAM, 16QAM, et cetera, it basically pushes that curve out about 25%. That 25% of spectrum I get uh, just directly feeds into and can use that for more capacity now. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the other thing that's happening in the optical network is the what was previously a 4-ish terahertz uh, amount of capacity in the C-band is amplifier technology is being increased to get to about 5 terahertz, which gives you an additional 25 percent. So all of a sudden I've got 50 percent more capacity just through uh, those, uh, those techniques. This chart shows a uh, QPS, PM QPSK transmitter. Uh, as you can see, it's also a pretty uh, complicated uh, optical circuit with a laser diode, polarization beam splitter, uh, these super mock Zender modulator structures that modulate both the intensity and phase of the light, the, the imaginary and real components uh, of, the of the phase states. Uh, now, interestingly, though, uh, as I was talk uh, talking about, the, uh, there's this capacity reach trade-off uh, between which modulation technique uh, you want to use, whether it's BPSK, QPSK, 8QAM, 16QAM, et cetera. It's nice to be able to build um, all of those different modulation schemes onto one circuit. Okay? And if you're building out of discrete parts, you'd be tempted to build individual boards for each of those individual modulation schemes, and you just deploy the uh, right board at the right time. Uh, a nice thing about photonic integration that uh, people are looking at is it allows you to build all those different uh, modulation schemes onto one optical circuit uh, and then basically software select which one you want to use at one time. And since it's in an, in an optical chip, photonic integrated circuit, it's basically the same cost uh, to get all those things. Much like DSL where you can trade off um, what reach you're getting, uh, it just dynamically trades off the reach versus the capacity and the number of carriers it uses, uh, and the bit rate, et cetera. Uh, optics is going the same, ray, uh, same way. We're getting a dial, going to be having a dial or reach capacity uh, capability uh, where at the baseline might be a PPM, uh, QPSK signal at 100 gig. Uh, you're getting a, a, con a particular reach, particular capacity. If I want to get additional reach, for whatever reason, I'm going sub-C across the Pacific or something. Uh, I can basically turn the knob, change my optical circuit, change the DSP configuration, get much more reach at you know, reduced capacity. Or I can go the other way. I can dial up 8 to 16 QAM, uh, get a lot less reach, but maybe it's a metro uh, area link that I don't need the reach. I just need to go 10 kilometers down the road or 100 kilometers down the road, not thousands of kilometers down the road. Uh, and I can have that capability. Uh, basically built into a single card that can, can uh, do those different things. Um, this uh, chart shows that uh, more graphically. <coughs> the, um, each of these signals is a terabit signal. And what you're seeing actually is the, the uh, black uh, portion uh, is actually showing multiple super channels <coughs> imposed on the same fiber. So it's, it's many uh, terabits across that fiber. 
but within the red box, each one is a terabit signal. And what we're doing is changing the number of carriers, changing the modulation format of each of those carriers to still get a terabit, but at different amounts of spectrum. And then at different amounts of spectrum, we can uh, put more or less of those super channels on the same fiber. So at the, as a result, at a shorter reach for a QPSK, we get 12 terabits on the fiber. But at uh, 16 qualm, if we want more capacity, we can get maybe 25 terabits uh, per second across the fiber. All right. So what's uh, nice, though, is that we can take those technologies, and because of the software programmability, we can use it on the same network that is being deployed today or in future uh, gridless networks that I'll, attach, uh, I'll, I'll discuss. So the uh, QPSK signals, the simple non-super channel signals, by, are, are being designed for 50 gigahertz based Rotom technology today. And you know the, the super channels can be made to fit through there uh, just by changing the programming. or um, as I do the super channel and I implement gridless uh, Rotom technology uh, in, in, the, uh, in the future part of the network, I can use less spectrum. But for different portions of the network, for different reaches that I need, I might use more or less a higher order uh, modulation scheme and it can all be compatible by programming the optical layer uh, as I need. Uh, so uh, and to summarize here, uh, we think that terabit waves uh, terabit channels are going to be happening in the form of super channel, and there's pretty broad consensus in the optical industry that that's the way uh, it's likely to happen. Uh, and, but we believe that uh, flexible modulation is going to be necessary to be able to trade off uh, different, uh, different reaches as you go. Um, these, these super channels are going to be made up of very tightly packed uh, wavelengths or, or individual channels. They're not going to be on the ITU grid because uh, you need to be able to pack them much more tightly than the ITU grid. They're not at 50 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz or, or something like that. Uh, but by having programmable optical circuits, programmable DSP uh, technology, you're going to be able to uh, uh, get all these things on first uh, today's network in a backward, backward compatible mode that doesn't give you the extra 25%, but in a future mode as this gridless uh, optical layer gets deployed, uh, uh, put out there. So, uh, but it, uh, to make this all economic, uh, to have this amount of programmability, uh, it's uh, probably uh, one way to improve that is, is, is some of the industry is going to try to do that through individual discrete uh, optical circuits. Um, other people are going to try to do it through photonic integrated circuits that are really going to uh, enable better economics uh, for that. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? True. Hi, this is Vishal Sharma from Matanoying. So you spoke about coherent modulation and coherent wave separation, right? And in the end, also you summarized it. But I'd like one clarification. In somewhere in, towards the end, you mentioned that you can, because of the programmability, you can use the super channel concept even today. And then, of course, as you move to gridless rodums, it becomes much easier to implement. So, to what, so to what extent can you actually do it today? Uh, where you do have the ITU grid, you know, what kind of capacity increases can you get for a super channel versus what would be possible when you didn't have, when you had a totally gridless environment? Yeah, I, I think I misspoke on uh, one of the slides near the end. Um, the, you, with today's 50 gigahertz based optical layer, you can't use the super channel uh, concept because you need each wavelength on a 50 gigahertz. Uh, some people, like in Venera, actually combine two wavelengths into at 25 gigahertz each, but mm -hmm. can fit that through 50 gigahertz. Uh, but otherwise, to get to the, the, the true super channel, the existing rotums don't work uh, because they've got that hard separation at 50 gigahertz. Okay, great. So that's what I was looking for. So that means to go to the super channels, we eventually need a gridless environment. Where that's we right. are untethered from the ITU grid, right? That is untethered from the ITU grid? Yeah. That is, uh, yes, exactly. Okay, thanks. Okay, anybody else? All right, Drew, thanks very much. All right, thank you, everybody.